So talking about uh, behavioral addictions. So uh, this is, I've updated some of some, uh, this is, there's some new stuff in here. There's some stuff that's kind of like older, uh, but still accurate. And I tried to update a lot of my slides and what I found was that um, not a lot of research has been happening in a lot of areas, yet there has been in others. So behavioral addictions, it's something that we all talk about. Clinically, we see it all the time. Uh, people who stop using substances, but <coughs> shunt to things like sex, eating, those types of things. And so I want to give you some of the, my perspective on things. Um, so if I think about sort of behavioral addictions and their similarities of substance use disorders, you know, we think about the four C's, control, compulsive use, consequences, and cravings. Those are the kind of typical features that we'll see with anything. And um, what's been different is that gambling disorder was included in the DSM-5 under sort of the substance use disorder section. Now, there's other parts that show up in different places that haven't quite made it in, and certainly there's active research going on to see whether uh, there's other pieces that will fall into the use disorder. Uh, but uh, understanding how the DSM works is they put together a work group, they look at the research, is this enough to really classify this within this category? Um, so gambling made it in, but the other ones, such as sex, such as internet, such as gaming, didn't make it in quite yet. Uh, we have kleptomania, which is in the impulse control disorders uh, still, so the uh, fire setting. And of course, there's sort of non-classified uh, process addictions, such as uh, pathological buying, skin picking, sexual addiction, tanning is one of them that I saw, interestingly enough. Mm -hmm. uh, although I would say tanning, there's probably something in that, because if you think about opioids, it starts with skin cells, the pro opio melanocortin, and uh, certainly we know that uh, there's controversy around for example, uh, people who have root suffer who don't suffer who have brutalism, redheads somehow do not have the same response to opioids as others, uh, allegedly, supposedly. That's been You're largely debunked. Her That's okay. Uh, I'm not mean, meaning to pick on anybody. Uh, internet addiction, of course, computer gaming. Now, this whole thing of computer gaming, I mean, by way of perspective, I've got a nine, soon to be ten year old, and a twelve year old at home. My daughter's twelve, my son is ten. And my son loves Fortnite. And to the point where I'm like, is this an addiction? Then all of a sudden, a couple of weeks ago, some 16-year-old won $3 million in the world Fortnite competition. So, you know, all things are somewhat relative. And uh, if I think about the behavioral addictions, um, some of the characteristics sort of similar to substance use disorders, you fail to resist an impulse, a drive, or a temptation. There, you want something, but you don't, can't resist it. Um, typically, uh, in comparing it with like substance use disorders, we see sort of adolescent transitional age onset, meaning that this is you know this is the time when we start to see people getting in trouble. Uh, there, there is a chronic relapsing and remitting course, and one of the things I'll say about the remitting part of it is that sometimes people just stop, uh, and just like my son loves Fortnite, his new passion is baseball. Uh, so. Suffice it to say, it's YouTube videos constantly, but it's no longer Fortnite, it's baseball. Um, and it's also true of the addictions as well, is the vast majority of people who suffer from the disease of addiction, the, the modal outcome is spontaneous remission, meaning people just stop. And of course, this flies in the face of chronic relapsing progressive disorder, which certainly is true for many people, but not for everybody. Some people just stop. Um, and of course, the cycle that we see is this tension and arousal that begins as an ego syntonic experience. Yeah. So I know that um, in the past, like previous iterations of the DSM, the behavioral addictions were conceptualized as disorders of impulse control, right? Like not uh, not otherwise specified. So in your like, based on this definition, do you kind of view it that way as like an impulse control issue, or do you really view it as more of like an addictive? Yeah, that's the thing. Uh, this is the thing where I'll frankly say I don't know. Because, um, so it, begin, it begins a sort of tension arousal, kind of like an impulse that mm -hmm. then you then give into. But over time, we see this transition from an egosyntonic experience to an ego dystonic experience uh, with many of the behavioral addictions. In the beginning, it's kind of fun to buy stuff. And after a while, it be turns into this compulsive sort of anxiety, anxiolytic type experience that looks much more like an addiction. Um, so it's a good question. Uh, certainly, when we think about the impulse control disorders, like for example, kleptomania, you know, I've had the I've had the opportunity to talk to a couple of people, or actually, uh, pyromania, for example, similar in some ways to kleptomania. Uh, I've talked to a few people, and it doesn't quite fit uh, insofar as it's sort of like impulsive, but at some point it becomes stress reactive. 
it becomes something that they do to calm themselves or uh, attenuate dysphoria or distress, which looks a lot more like addiction uh, than something else. And part of the challenge with this, part of the challenge with sort of like the nomenclature is what is this? Is this impulse? Is this compulsive? Is there somewhere in between? And I would say yes to all of the above. Um, in that sort of transition from something that's fun to something you have to do, it's habitual and compulsive, and it moves from positive reinforcement, chasing reward, to negative reinforcement, which is avoiding pain. So that's the transition, and that's often that we see for patients presenting for treatment. At that point, they, they don't want to go through opioid withdrawal. Uh, they don't want to experience the pain of life or PTSD or whatever, what have you. Um, Certainly we uh, see cravings, and of course there is a certain amount of tolerance that occurs with all the behavioral and process addictions. They say it doesn't feel as good, it needs to be something more exciting, the amount that I'm betting is you know, sort of more money. And that stress reactive piece, particularly around, I'm gonna talk about paraphilias, which isn't per se an addiction, this is more of like a kind of a one-off that doesn't really fit any place else. I guess it's under uh, disorders of sexual desire. The stress reactivity component is very prominent, particularly amongst the paraphilias, but also gambling mm -hmm. as well. And of course, if we look at the personality components, you know, the people look same or similar. There's an impulsive sensation-seeking aspect. Uh, there's low harm avoidance, so they're more motivated by reward than necessarily worried about what could potentially happen. Uh, we see some high rates of compulsivity, doing stuff repetitively. Uh, trying to organize, and of course, poor inhibition, which really should come as no surprise uh, when we think about these disorders. Would you consider those personality components? Because I think George Valiant really captured it when he said, we generalize from looking at people in the middle of their abuse cycle, and if you can get them before and after, you see heterogeneity. Right. I mean, these are the studies of the people in the midst of an abuse okay. cycle. Uh, and when they get into treatment, I mean, the good news with the, the majority of the so-called process addictions is they tend to be fairly treatable. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're fairly well treatable, and the interventions required aren't just massive interventions. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, to the extent that once they've you know, stopped, what do they look like afterwards, uh, that's a good question. So I would say that there may be a certain more heterogeneity, but uh, when they pull these sort of studies around impulsivities, they're looking at things like the BART. Uh, they're looking at the... Uh, Iowa gambling task, sort of after the fact, and you know these are the people who keep going for deck two or just make make the balloon blow up. Does anybody know, everybody know what the bard and the IGT is? So the Iowa gambling task is a great one. You have four decks of cards, and with every card you flip over, you can both win money or lose money or just win or lose money. And um, there are two high risk. There is one exceptionally high risk de de deck. Uh, there are two very safe decks, and there's one that's sort of in between, is my understanding. But for you psychologists who have actually administered this test, feel free to co correct me. And with the Iowa gambling task, essentially, you're just randomly pushing things, and I think there's a total of maybe 50, 5, 0 iterations. You can try different cards out, and at some point you start to guess which decks are the safe decks. It's kind of the conservative play. And um, there's one desk that's very, deck that's very high reward, but high risk at the same time. Uh, and uh, only once, uh, I was sitting with Tim DeRazzo doing it on one of my more impulsive OTP, ORT formerly, uh, patients, he cleared one of the decks, which was the high-risk deck, and uh, Tim DeRazzo said, I've never seen this before, and Tim DeRazzo is a sort of a research neuropsychologist, mm -hmm. uh, and it sort of comported with his general tendency towards impulsivity. Uh, the BART is a, a test where you're, you're blowing up a balloon to the point where you want to get it as big as possible without it popping, and uh, I don't know the construct of that as well, but it's another test of impulsivity. How big, how big can I push this balloon before it blows up? And the other key is when you start to see, you know, one of the things I like to think about with all these, like whether it's an individual diagnosis, is what comes along for the ride? What else is there? And when it comes to substance use disorders, it turns out a lot of this, uh, a lot of these so-called process addictions, behavioral addictions, are comorbids. Uh, we see that with. And so somebody does have a substance use disorder, we should be asking questions about problem or pathological gambling, kleptomania, skin picking. Uh, the sexual behavior piece is particularly prominent, at least based upon this particular study. <clears throat> and I would say uh, clinically, if you've got somebody using stimulants, you have to ask about sex, period. I know this is probably the 120th time I've said that in this room from this very seat. If you hear about somebody using stimulants, you must ask about sex, and not from a uh, perspective of prurient interest, it's much more around behaviors. What sexual behaviors? How are you doing it? 
Uh, moreover, I think it really impacts the treatment side of the house because there are very few treatment modules that actually consider the role of sex mm -hmm. in the addiction. Uh, when it comes to stimulants, uh, stimulants feel good, sex feels better on stimulants, and as such, they get kind of melded together. Uh, many of us have worked with patients, particularly men who have sex with men, where the idea of stimulants, se sex without stimulants, is inconceivable, if not antithetical. Uh, the other piece that I also see, too, is men who identify as heterosexual, straight, when they're not using, hue uh, towards gay porn when they are under the influence of stimulants. And that produces a tremendous amount of shame. Uh, it, certainly there's a neurobiological basis to it in that, look, sex is fun and the whole is a whole at some point when you're using stimulants. Uh, but the fact is what we worry about is the behaviors. Uh, how many of you have heard, ever heard of a booty bump before? Nobody? Some? Okay. So a booty bump is when you're um, typically amongst men who have sex with men, and if there is basically what you do is put a certain amount of crystal meth on your partner's rectum, you force it in with your erect penis. Uh, which is, um, you know, getting uh, rectal medications is an effective way to absorb it, but at the same time, crystal meth is very bad for condoms. And so when you're talking about sort of the same-sex behavior when somebody's in the midst of use, you ask about specific questions. Do you do booty bumps? If so, how can you reduce the risk? And a lot of the risk that's attached to it, uh, the answer should be, well, you re really should be considered for PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis. Uh, and until we can get you to stop using, the main thing we don't want you to do is become HIV positive. So again, when you see a substance use disorder, ask about the other stuff because it often comes with it. And of course, you can't catch everything in an initial assessment. It's hard to you know, sort of hit that ski slope. Uh, a lot of this stuff people feel profoundly, <coughs> profoundly ashamed of. And if they feel ashamed of it, it's going to take time for it to be revealed over the course of treatment. And of course, the other piece is that if you make it explicit, uh, for example, the matrix module. Uh, so matrix is a manualized guide uh, for methamphetamine treatment, and it works really well. Uh, Joan can tell you a particular story about matrix and why her program worked better than the rest. Uh, but suffice it to say, it's one of the few things that actually has a chapter on sexual behavior. So I encourage you to look at it. The other thing I personally like about matrix compared to like something like DBT, I don't know how many of you read Linehan. I can't. I mean, I have a 26th grade education. I can't read Linehan. Her, her language is impenetrable, even in the therapist's guide. You have to see her. You have to see her. Oh, I met her. I've, I've no, but the you mean actually see her in action? Yeah. Okay, maybe that's the case. I mean, I met her in the University of Washington before I read her, and then I tried to read her. I'm like, oh, mm -hmm. I can't do this. Whereas Matrix is written in the sixth grade language, um, which is very, you know, if somebody's coming off of stimulants, you, you kind of want to keep it simple. Um, and I think Matrix is the way that all, you know, if you're writing your own treatment manual at some point, read Matrix, try to make it that simple. And if you can, good on you. Now, when it comes to the treatment side of the house, there's 12-step um, uh, MI, cognitive behavioral therapy. There's the traditional relapse prevention interventions, both individual as well as group. And then there's a couple of medications that have shown some signal, but I wouldn't say it's convincing. I, w I wouldn't describe it as terribly convincing. I'll go over some of the data later. Um, now, Trexone uh, has been shown to be effective for gambling, but the doses that they use for gambling are very high doses. So a typical dose of naltrexone a day is about 50 milligrams, 5-0, versus the modal dose that they use for gambling to show significant effect was up to 155 milligrams. So on average, 155, almost 200 milligrams of the medication. Um, uh, topiramate, which is sort of works on glutaminergic tone, anti-seizure medication, weight loss medication, helps with things like skin picking, uh, pathological purchasing, uh, gambling. And then N-acetylcysteine, which is a uh, basically a, a antioxidant amino acid that affects the glutamate system, uh, where it seems to work with gambling. So that is the gross overview of behavioral addictions. Can we go right back for a minute to sex and stimulants? Yes. Under what conditions would you suggest to a patient that they ought to abstain from sex to disrupt that connection? And so is it wasting your breath? Uh, I don't know that it's wasting my breath because, uh, for example, Steve Shopta's program, I think we've talked about this before many years prior, but Steve Shopta is a, uh, I believe he's a, is he a psychologist, UCLA. Oh, yeah, UCLA, mm -hmm. and he runs uh, a program and there's an inpatient treatment program that uh, I think, I don't know if it's primarily for men who have sex with men, but it's, it, it, there's a large population. And these are kind of longer term residential treatment programs that he runs and he actually actively encourages them to find sex while they're in treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, which would seem to fly in the face of it because it, it realizes that for a lot of these patients, sex is part of their identity 
and we should do it in treatment because the likelihood of having having a sexual encounter starting early in treatment is the likelihood of return to use, aka relapse. And his argument, and I find it a compelling argument, look, if you're gonna relapse, better you do it in treatment we figure out how to do it differently rather than put you in this environment where you're never exposed mm -hmm. and thus uh, you can't do it. Now for some patients, particularly if we think about stimulants and cue-induced cravings and sex being one of those cues, the cue-induced cravings I think are rather unique when it comes to stimulants. It's incredibly powerful, it's incredibly quick, and it's virtually automatic. Uh, they do this by basically fMRI studies where they you know, kind of flash images of a pipe, the tenderloin, something that would uh, kind of cue somebody around the stimulant use. And even if it's subconscious, like 0.1 seconds, they will start to develop cravings. And so for some patients, it's just not possible. Uh, I think of one patient that I worked with who was through the, what was formerly known as the day hospital. And at some point, uh, he stopped using. Uh, he did stop using. And to my knowledge, he remains abstinent from uh, stimulants, methamphetamine, and he self-identified as gay. And what he does now is that he says he, never, he doesn't have sex with men. I talked to him a couple of years back and just, you know, this topic came up. He says he doesn't have sex with men. For him, it's too dangerous. It's too likely for that to happen. Yet what he does is he actually cues towards methamphetamine porn, meaning that he watches men have sex with other men, sweaty, diaphoretic, their pupils are dilated, they're obviously you know, under the influence of the stimulant, and he masturbates to that. And I said, isn't that risky, isn't that hazardous? Like, hey, look, it, it does what it, I need it to do. And to me, I said that that's a terrible, I would think that that's a terrible idea, but it was his solution to the problem that he could get sexual satisfaction you know, come close, but not step over the line. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that there's a clear answer, yay, nay, or something like that. I think that this, like many things, it has to do with iteration, repetition, and sort of figuring out what works and what doesn't work, and having a plan to keep somebody fundamentally safe, but moreover, be able to talk about it in the future. Uh, I think the thing that everybody needs to get comfortable with is taking a sexual history. Um, because if you don't, if you're not comfortable taking a sexual history, people will, I, we, they will feel your discomfort uh, innately and just not go there. And the way that I ask people about stimulants and sex is like, oh, I, you know, where's the question I often ask is, well, so what role does sex, stimulants play with sex or sex play with stimulants? And if they say none, I'd say like, huh, that's, I'm kind of surprised because in my experience, most patients have some sort of, um, the, the practice gets uh, wrapped up in some way or another, which kind of opens the invitation. Uh, which doesn't uh, always doesn't always lead to a bite and sort of a talk about it, but at least lets it open to let them know that hey, look, this is something that I'm concerned about. The other thing, if I think about patients too, is that when it comes to many of my medications I prescribe, SSRIs and others, hey, this could affect your sex drive, and I want you to let you, I want to let you know as your doctor, I believe that your sex life is important to you, and if you're starting to notice problems, please let me know because it's the number one reason why people stop the medications. Uh, mm -hmm. is because they find that they're having difficulty with uh, sex. They have less libido, they have difficulty with sexual functioning. Uh, please let me know. Uh, and I sort of put it on the table and leave it as, you know, kind of one of those bases that I sort of touch as I'm going through typical medication side effects. All right. So that is the gross overview. Now I'm gonna get into stuff that actually has a little bit more science to it, so to speak. Uh, this is an older slide. Um, God, it's an old slide. It's not called the Orc Clinic anymore. Um, yeah. How many paraphilias, separate paraphilias can we count here? One, two, three. Anyways, uh, so par at least four. And maybe more, depending on what's going on inside your head. Um, <laughs> So talking about the paraphilia, so if I think about paraphilias, I can't talk about paraphilias without talking about sex offender, the quote unquote sex offender. Uh, there's kind of one, they're not one and the same, but the sex offender population is a population they often be called to work with. Um, this is an older slide, and I really tried to update this data, but I couldn't find a lot of stuff. Um, but in 90, 1997, 10% of prisoners were incarcerated for violent sex offenses. Now, rem I, I remind you, 1997, we're in the height of a drug war. We're incarcerating like crazy for substance use disorders, and what's happening now is that more and more people are getting released with substance use disorders or not getting arrested or you know, kind of not ending up in prison. And for those of you who don't work in prisons and jails, jail is where you go after you're arrested. Jail is where you go to serve a misdemeanor sentence, which is typically one year or less. Prison is where you go when you're convicted of a felony. 
So when I say jail and prison, I'm talking about two different things. And the majority of inmates are in jails, not prisons. So when I think about prisons, these are people who have been convicted of offense and incarcerated for a period of at least a year, if not longer. Uh, of this group of patients, two-thirds victimized children, and the majority of vic the victims were young, 12 years or younger. And, um, you know, a lot of this stuff I think about sort of like when famous cases show up, uh, Larry Nasser from Michigan State University, uh, Jeffrey Epstein, the, that type of thing. And I know this is going to go up on YouTube, so at the same time, I'm not talking about anything that's secret. Um, and back then, there were 386,000 convicted sex offenders registered in California. I'm certain that number's increased, although they are changing the, they changed the rules two years ago to make it easier to get off the sex offender list. Because historically, once on that list, you were always on that list, and you could never get off. And so if it's minor sex offenses, there is an opportunity to get off the convicted sex offender list. Um, definitionally, sex offender is somebody who's convicted of a sex offense, and they have to register with local law enforcement. And that's true nationwide. California was the first state to have it, but every state sort of followed. Uh, there's a community reporting requirement, and uh, versus somebody who's a sexually violent predator, um, there's a generally universal definition, meaning that somebody's convicted of a sex offense, and because of mental disease, disorder, or abnormality, they're likely to reoffend. Um, and so there's two steps. You've been convicted of a sex offense, and so that's a criminal proceeding. And then being called a sexually violent predator is actually not a criminal proceeding. It's a, ci it's a civil proceeding. And in order to be found that, you have to go before a civil proceeding, which looks a lot like a criminal matter. Uh, but essentially, then you're declared a sex offender based upon the testimony of expert psychologists, mostly psychologists, sometimes psychiatrists, get into that arena as well. And because of the mental disease disorder abnormality, which makes you likely to reoffend. Now, we tend to think of that mental disorder as being a paraphilia, but often they can classify things like antisocial personality disorder. This counts towards a mental disorder, whereas in other places, for example, criminal responsibility, antisocial personality disorder does not get you off. So this is one of those things where it's kind of a broadening of what will catch you in the net. Now, the paraphilia, oh, DSM-4, well, it hasn't changed. So um, a paraphilia, I mean, there's recurrent, recurrent intense sexually arousing fantasies, urges, or behaviors that involve non-human objects, uh, the suffering or humiliating of oneself or a partner, children, or non-consenting persons that have lasted at least six months. So, uh, and a lot of times, you have to draw a line someplace. So I'll give you an example. If you have a couple uh, who are engaged in, for example, bondage, domination, sadomasochistic behaviors, yet both adults are consenting and they find it pleasurable as part of their spectrum of sexual expression, it's not a disorder. Whereas when one of the partners says, okay, this is ego dystonic and it's causing dysfunction in my life, okay, then it's a disorder. Um, and so really the line is kind of a societal line as to what falls in versus not. Um, for people who have, for example, uh, fantasies around uh, minors, people who are young. Uh, where is that problematic? Well, it's problematic if they actually touch a minor, or it's also problematic if they, um, they cause ego dystonia. dystonia. Whereas the person who has these fantasies and has no ostensible dysfunction doesn't get qualified as paraphilic. So it's one of those weird things where, you know, what impact on society, what impact of people comes into play? Um, now, the, uh, and by way of background, so I did work with patients with paraphilia. Uh, these were patients mostly through my forensic fellowship, and I did a little bit of my private practice afterwards. Uh, these are people who were famous for all the wrong reasons. Uh, they show up in the news with some regularity. I'm like, don't do that. Uh, but suffice it to say, um, it was interesting to hear their stories, but nevertheless, you know, once you've actually had an opportunity to work with patients with paraphilia, it's, it's kind of a whole new world but at the same time, it's not. A lot of the same stuff we do in addiction around impulse control, relapse prevention, you know, keeping yourself out of risky situations all come into play. Now, um, if we look at people who are convicted, again, this is, a, this is a certain population. They got caught, they got convicted. And um, this was a study done by Gene Abel uh, over in Atlanta, and he does a lot of work around sort of impaired professionals and also paraphilias, where the two together, I'm not quite sure, but um, I think he's retired now. Uh, but this particular, the first study was a study that actually had the very highest level of federal confidentiality. You know, we think of HIPAA, we think of sort of, you know, mental health confidentiality, we think of 42 CFR. There's yet a higher one that nobody knows about and nobody's ever gotten except for this one single study. Uh, that basically said anything discovered in the study is not discoverable anywhere. 
And so they were asking people convicted of various sex offenses um, how many victims that they had, and the average number was 150. And the way they established that is through polygraph. Uh, how many of you have ever dealt with poly? Some of you, you've been in a forensic setting before, I'm guessing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so when it comes to the polygraph examination, it's not admissible in court by itself, but it's something that I, as an expert, or you know, sort of any type of, you know, I've had polygraph come up a couple of times in sort of marital law cases that I do. Um, it's a really good piece of history gathering. Uh, it really helps with gathering history. So you basically polygraph them. Uh, before, I think it was the average number of victims that they admitted to was like 27. You know, they had already had that federal confidentiality, and then when they put them on polygraph, it went up to 150. But the end was anywhere between one up to 2,000 plus victims. And so there is a, when we think about a single convicted sex offender or somebody who actually engages in behavior, the public health risk is great. Um, the most, uh, the most common number of victims were, not surprisingly, exhibitionists, so people who would sort of flash themselves. Uh, and what's interesting is when you dig into every one of the individual paraphilias, you see this collection of fantasies. The fantasy is sort of what they think about, or you know, what is the image that they're going for? And with exhibitionism, it's, the clear fantasy is that people are some that are shocked, like, oh my good, I'm my goodness. Um, I used to ask the question, how many of the women here have been uh, the victim of an exhibitionist? And many hands we raised. I'm not asking that question right now. But it's something that does happen a lot, and the fantasy is that, look, uh, th they're looking for that look of shock. That's actually exciting. Frottage, which is uh, rubbing up against people in uh, sort of crowded places, BART, Muni, those types of things. And uh, interestingly, the fantasy there is that the loving sexual, it's a loving exchange of sex, which on BART, I can't imagine that, but <laughs> then again, I, anyways. Um, uh, pedophilia against boys outside the home, so non-minor children inside, and then of course, voyeurism, people sort of, the peeping Tom type story. Uh, there's a lot of crossover, and there is not just, just like there's usually not one addiction, there's not just one paraphilia. Uh, there's crossover between touching and non-touching offenses, uh, offending against family members and non-family members, females and males, and victim age. So we tend to think of, um, you know, one of the things to ask your patients about or, you know, try to identify in their sexual partners, there's often a type. And uh, this may not be so true with the advent of Tinder, Grindr, and easy sex nowadays, but often there's a type in which they find themselves sexually attracted to. Whereas individuals with paraphilias, the type breaks down. It's not just a single type. There are many potential victims um, or uh, targets of interest. Now, Do you think that relates to like opportunism? There's an aspect of opportunism in there. Um, I remember I was talking to one person who talked about sort of had a um, had an exhibition. It was an exhibitionist. And uh, at some point, there was, it was an opportunistic thing, but it wasn't just the opportunity, but there was an escalating pattern of like how to get caught, or at least how to be seen. And at some point he decided to, at some point, and it's always, almost always a he, uh, at some point he decided to uh, go to a place where sex workers are known to traffic, and so he started masturbating in the car, and a sex worker came in and said, hey honey, can I help you with that? And he was not turned on. He didn't like that because it didn't fit the fundamental fantasy of shock mm -hmm. and something like that. So um, there is some a aspect of opportunist opportunism, and it's the rare person who can't control themselves with the awareness that they're going to somehow get caught. And the other thing you have to sort of pull out of this is manic episodes. When people are in the midst of a manic episode, um, you know this this behavior cannot be just simply because they're manic or simply under the influence of a stimulant. Uh, with pedophilia itself, so the majority is exclusively heterosexual. Um, this sort of breaks against the narrative of gay men being predators. Uh, that's totally not the case. The majority of pedi people, uh, uh, pedophiles are heterosexual pedophiles, and the majority molest known victims, family members, friends, people within their circle, and very very small percentage actually go for stranger victims. Um, and this is the same ABLE study of 400, or a different ABLE study of 453 pedophiles of all the acts, 55% were girls. Uh, nearly all non-touching acts involve females, whereas the majority of hands-on touching were against boys. Um, but the reoffending risk, he found it not to be predictable by the victim gender. Whether it was women or men, the likelihood of reoffending was attenuated by other factors rather than just the gender of the victim. Yeah? Uh, for folks who think this was, were they either only, the victims were either only or girls or boys, or was there a mix? There's a mix. There's a mix. But of all the individual acts, whether they were with girls or boys, the majority were with girls. Yeah. 
What's like the difference between like uh, touching versus like literal touching? At some point, once you put hands on, that is a touching act versus mutual masturbation or something along those lines would be considered a non-touching act. Very obviously not legal, crossing a boundary, but the actual t act of touching themselves. And touching uh, can include a variety of things, such as uh, fondling genitals, uh, touching it all the way up to actual penetrative sex. So it's touching is a large range, but there seems to be something about the actual touch itself, whereas a lot of the offenses don't involve touching at all. So uh, some screening questions. Uh, and again, this is one of those things where you have to be, you know, not necessarily sex positive, but sex comfortable. Kinkiest piece of pornography you enjoy. Uh, how long have you been sexually involved with children, which sounds extremely loaded, but it's one of those things that you can ask and somebody will say, no, no, uh-uh, that's not the case. I mean, a lot of these screening questions, given the sensitivity, I would recommend doing it after you've kind of built an alliance. It may not come up immediately, but it's sort of one of those things you just kind of wonder about. And, or how long you've been viewing pornography. Um, now, one of the things this is more editorializing. I, I wonder about the sexuality, what's happening with people's sexuality to the access to pornography nowadays. Not a subject of this particular talk, but when it comes to pornography, it's wholly available. You can get any scenario that you, virtually any scenario that you want to, on demand. And how is that affecting sexuality? Well, what we know is that people of a certain age, primarily 20 something year olds, are having much less sex than, other pe than their historical peers. Um, we know that there, yeah, less sex is happening, and maybe it's because the virtual world is substituting for the real world. Uh, think of an episode of like Black, probably an episode of Black Mirror or something like that. Um, uh, suppose that paraphilic acts have been carried out. This is somebody, particularly somebody who's convicted. I have to make an assumption that if one, then many others. Uh, Gene Abel was talking about uh, this one particular. Uh, he decided to create an inv the Abel inventory, every possible sex act under the sun that he could even imagine. And so he did this, he handed this one this one person, and be, or he handed it to people, and they would check off a whole bunch of boxes, like, have I ever done da 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 And he was thinking, like, is this some exhibitionistic sort of, like, sort of, you know, narcissistic I'm showing off in some ways? And he actually put a question at the very bottom that said, I've, I've had sex with dead animals. And the first person he gives it to endorses the questionnaire, and he says, whoa, whoa, whoa hold on a second. It, You've had sex with dead animals, he's like yes. He's like he's like okay, and the guy comes in with a Polaroid of a dead deer on his bed in a purple nightgown the next week. So multiple paraphilias again. Uh, so I think that it's um, when you're asking a history, you have to assume. Yeah, see, I see some people like Ugh. that's kind of gross. Yeah, uh, is it? A dead deer in a purple nightgown. Is it? Yeah. No, I. It, I mean it. To me, it sounds disgusting, but at the same time, it's, this is the part of like, you know, you have to understand the spectrum of human experience. It goes there. And some people just don't have a taste for it. Some people can't do this work. I mean, I could do this work before, but now that I've got kids, I can't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, I just don't want to do it, and I'll send them all to Doug Tucker instead, um, <laughs> who's another psychiatrist who got me into this whole thing in the first place. Um, you know, you want to avoid labels, uh, although. So can I ask what's changed for you then? Is it just strictly just, it's just not having, personal? Yeah, I think yeah. it's become more personal, and people don't ask me for this anymore because a lot of the cases were through the forensic fellowship. Doug would send them to me, and mm -hmm. if I got sent another case, I'd be willing to take it on because suffice it to say, after working in a methadone program, especially a VA methadone program, my tolerance for risk is exceptionally ridiculous. Mm -hmm. I will take on the tough cases in a private practice when I probably shouldn't because I've seen the, the sickest people here at the VA. And so uh, nowadays I don't get the cases as much, but if I were referred that, that I'd probably consider it. Uh, the other reason I don't like it too is that insurance is hesitant to pay for the medications that are absolutely necessary. Mm -hmm. And the medications work really, really, really well uh, in my experience, uh, on par with methadone or buprenorphine for opioid use disorder in male um, paraphilics. But having said that, the insurance is just unlikely to pay. Are you are you going to get to the medications, or are you? Yeah. Well, the yeah. Um, the, well, the main one is uh, Lupron, which or Lupron and various other GnRH agonists, which basically shuts down testosterone, aka chemical castration. Um, I want to the, when you're doing an assessment, focus on specific acts, duration, first occurrence, antecedents. Antecedents being that sort of the universal stress reactive part of things. Uh, you want to clarify victim characteristics as well as preferences. Now, there's psychophysiologic assessment. Uh, these are typically done mostly by psychologists, uh, typically in research lab. Penile plethysmography is 
kind of not as popular nowadays because it's invasive. Uh, there's circumferential where you're putting a strain gauge in the penis and measuring blood flow. Uh, if there's an increase in 10% in uh, circumference, then it's you know partially sensitive to pedophilia, but very specific. Uh, but neither one, and then there's a volumetric where you actually put, um, you cover the uh, testicles and the penis and you sort of look for volumetric differences in blood flow. Uh, greater sensitivity and specificity, but just not as popular nowadays. Virtually everybody uses the ABLE screen, uh, which is the assessment for sexual interest. And the task here is that they've shown a number of images that are not objectively pornographic. These are clothed images and they're various uh, different types of scenarios. And the length of response latency uh, is measured and correlated with self-reports of sexual interest, meaning if somebody finds something sexually attractive, they're going to look at it longer. You're going to stare longer if you, there's something you find to be uh, sexually interested in. And um, the nice thing about this particular test is it's a brief administration. It's less than an hour. You don't need a special lab. Um, it's uh, normed to males and females down to age 12, and it's non-nude stimuli, so you don't run afoul of anything. Because the more precise the stimuli, the better to measure the reaction. And you can't show pictures of new children, even if they're virtual. You just can't do that. Um, and the great thing about the visual reaction time is you can actually measure treatment progress. Uh, because what should happen is that they should respond, they should sp spend more time looking at things that are considered to be normative for whatever that they'd like. Versus the deviant stuff, they should spend less time looking at it. Um, and there, is, uh, there are ways to fake it, but when you fake it, like if you're being the one for whom the test is administered, if you're faking it, it's pretty obvious. You're like, you know, you're just sort of clicking through. Or you try to spend more time looking at something because you know that that's the right answer, and it's just it, the there's enough iterations with enough time looking at something that you can that the fakes are pretty clear. And how is that measured in terms of the duration that the nude looking at the image? Is there a camera, or is it just the person sitting there? Uh, there's a, well, and actually, the it's button clicks. Oh. So they're measuring the button click. They're not actually looking at where they're looking at. Although somebody sitting with them, if somebody distracts themselves by looking away from the image, you can sort of you know adjust for that. Is my understanding. But mostly it's how quickly you're clicking onto the next frame. I mentioned polygraph, very good. Uh, it gets you a lot of information. And also the nice thing about polygraph is not just, is really in treatment monitoring. And so uh, I actually have a patient right now who is undergoing polygraph examinations for nothing related to paraphilias, but um, the patient stopped deciding to do uh, the polygraphs because too much information was being revealed. And the problem with the polygraph administrator and the therapist is the therapist had no boundaries. And so the therapist saw something on polygraph and quickly, instantly reported it to probation. And that was like, I'm like, that's not therapeutic. Uh, we need to talk about what's going on here before making a decision to report. Now, counseling, uh, there's behavioral therapy, uh, blocking or reducing deviant fantasies. And um, uh, in, this, in this particular uh, group, a fair amount of aversive conditioning goes on. Uh, there's the rubber band snaps, there is um, uh, sniffing sm smelling salts uh, if they find themselves, uh, they find themselves deviantly aroused. Uh, there's cognitive behavioral therapy uh, that involves, looks at cognitive distortions. To give you some examples of cognitive distortions uh, for children, um, the children were uh, coming on to me. Uh, I'm educating the child in some ways. Uh, I, I'm doing them a favor. Um, so these are some of the cognitive distortions in which we work with. And again, there's a specific taste for people who go for this kind of thing that you can actually say this with a straight face or without having your own gut reaction. Um, relapse prevention and victim empathy training, sort of you know, getting, giving them the perspective of the victim actually seems to work. Uh, the old reputation for antisocial personality disorder is that victim empathy just made them better criminals, but more recent research suggests that it is effective in reducing the risk of uh, reoffending. Now, with the medications, pharmacotherapy is really the primary, is, is, is a big piece of it. I think counseling for individuals, particularly convicted sex offenders, you have to think about pharmacotherapy. The non-convicted sex offender or lower-risk sex offender, um, maybe we don't go there quite yet. Uh, and there's a range of medications. Now, the, test, the main angle, again, this is testosterone. And I'm not saying there are not women sex offenders out there. We know that they are there, but relatively speaking, there are so few compared to the number of men, we just don't have enough numbers to get really good research. Uh, if I think about the case of the teacher, Mary Kay Letourneau, with uh, her student, 
Um, she was a teacher who repeatedly was, uh, was having sex with an underage student. I think it was in junior high school or something like that. Fast forward 25 years, they're married. They have kids. And so was that paraphilia? Uh, uh, yeah, but I don't know. It's kind of, it, for me, I don't see enough female uh, sex offenders to really know. I don't think I've seen any at all, actually, if you think about it. Um, testosterone. So anything that sort of hits testosterone. So one of the things is progesterone. High dose progesterone, Depo-Provera, Medroxy progesterone. Uh, this is the most common time, and it's a progesterone agent which inhibits gonadotropin secretion. Um, it induces the metabolism of testosterone and also shuts down testosterone production. Now, a normal testosterone is 300 to 1200, depending on your reference lab. Sometimes I've seen, you know, 1100, 1050, but 300 is usually the low end of the cutoff. And when you put on somebody on Depo-Provera, and it's not just one injection of Depo-Provera, it's six injections of Depo-Provera. So the injection of Depo-Provera to prevent pregnancy for three months is about 50 milligrams, whereas it's about 300 milligrams to treat these patients. Um, we see a reduction in sex drive, erotic fantasies. Uh, interestingly, the deviant fantasies, the paraphilic ones, tend to get preferentially hit before the healthy sexual fantasies. And a lot of the work in treatment is to reduce the deviancy and increase the healthy sexual fantasies. Uh, there's this one particular treatment called masturbatory satiation, which means that the instruction is to masturbate to orgasm for men with a healthy subject for about 10 minutes and continue masturbating for 45 to 50 minutes thereafter with unhealthy things, which frankly turns out not to be a lot of fun. Uh, again, this aversive conditioning piece that comes into play. Um, but when it comes to medications, it seems to hit the deviant fantasies, which are kind of at the tip of the iceberg first before hitting the sexual, the non-deviant fantasies. And for a lot of the patients that I've worked with, the non-deviant fantasies are almost in hibernation. They can't imagine this as an outlet for healthy sexual uh, activity. Uh, Depo-Provera is not feminizing. We don't see breast growth and those type of things. Now, the GNRH agonist, tryptoreal, and I don't think it's one that's available in the United States. Uh, typically, I think about Lupron. Uh, essentially, these are GnRH agonists, meaning that it turns on gonadotropin-releasing hormone. And the reason that we produce estrogen, progesterone, as well as testosterone is we get a pulsatile release of gonadotropin-releasing hormone, and what this is doing is just turning it on all the time, which then shuts down that feedback loop. Um, the testosterone decreases to 5 to 15 nanograms per milliliter, and for those of us who have done this long enough, we see the difference between 50 and 5 to 15. Um, there was a study that looked at 40 men, and they found no recidivism during a five-year period, and it decreased the intensity and frequency of the fantasies. Um, the, the GnRH agonists are uh, the in, they're injections that can last once. You can do it once a month, once every three months. even have one that lasts up to a year. And the medical use is for, uh, prostate, can for prostate cancer. We're knocking out testosterone. In that study, and I'll show you some other outcome studies that shows, you know, gender, there's not enough good studies of this particular treatment. There's many more studies of medroxyprogesterone, uh, such that a Cochrane review looked at it and they said, look, we don't have enough good stuff recently that we can actually say yay or nay. Um, and when, when you knock somebody's testosterone level down, whether because of GNRH, uh, a GNRH uh, agonist or methadone, <laughs> for the, for, to be perfectly plain, um, in, this, in this group, you have to monitor testosterone level because there are sources of exogenous testosterone, anabolic steroids, or just plain testosterone. You have to min monitor bone mineral density and uh, with DEXA scans because I've seen some patients who become very quickly profoundly osteopenic, if not frankly osteoporotic, and then you treat them. You, we usually do some type of prophylaxis to prevent uh, bone mineral density. Now, uh, castration, uh, surgical castration reduces plasma testosterone massively, and uh, there have been multiple studies of surgical castration showing effectiveness, uh, and recidivism rates are less than 5%. Um, but it, does, it just doesn't happen very often, although I have heard of various people who says like, look, I don't want to feel like this. Uh, I don't want to think about this anymore. Castrate. And it's always a challenge, particularly within the correctional system, is this voluntary, is this willing, is this something that is, you know, something that they want to do or somebody pressuring them to do so. Now, if I think about recidivism rates, um, there was an old review from Hall and I looked for a more recent one. There ain't much out there, which really was a disappointment to me. 
Uh, but in untreated individuals, about 27% during the course of the follow-up, and in treated individuals, about 19%. This is a multi-year follow-up. I forget how many years, but it was several years to the point where we would know. Uh, there was a Hansen uh, study that looked at 46 months follow-up, and they compared treatment as usual versus cognitive behavioral therapy, and what they found is the CBT did better versus treatment as usual. Now, if I look at the antiandrogens, where does that come in? There's a Bricken review uh, who, from six months to seven years in 118 subjects, they found 0% relapse in treatment. Whereas uh, Grossman did another, uh, another thing using antiandrogens plus CBT, and they found uh, there was a reduction uh, over time. And um, they used CBT plus medication. They found that non-institutional treatment was better, and the criminal record was an important predictor. If somebody did this a lot before, they're likely to do it again. Uh, I talked about the Cochrane review, so they found that uh, ciproterone acetate, which is very much like uh, Depo, which is like Luprolide, um, it's not pop they didn't find enough studies to compare to look for, uh, do a meta-analysis on. Versus uh, medroxyprogesterone, they found that effect it was effective at various mixed rates. So again, the, the most modern treatment, which is GNR agonist, has not frankly been that well researched. Although the next level of expertise, which is people who do it, they say it works better. Uh, and if you talk to people over in Colinga State Hospital, they say it does work better. What about cost? Like is um, Eagle I don't think it's very expensive, but like Lupron. It's not very expensive, but if you dose at the accurate at the correct dose, it's about the same price of Lupron. So if you give them six injections instead of just one, you're starting to approach Lupron type prices. And this is, this is an expensive treatment. Uh, you're talking about chemotherapy, you're talking about monitoring, you're talking about sort of counseling, everything that goes with it. So there's, it's a heavy lift, let's put it that way. And they did a, I looked at another systematic review from uh, Turner 2018. They looked at um, two th the literature from 2003 to 2017 and they found that um, in this systematic review they looked at total of 256 total subjects. I forget how much had the LHR agonist versus um, the uh, progesterone and they used objective measures. So part of the reason, the only way you can make it in the review is if you did something like penile plethysmography or the ABLE test where you actually looked at objective tests. And what they found is the LHR agonist worked better uh, than the steroidal antiandrogens. Uh, but at the same time, they recommended as a result of their systematic review, LHRH agonists should only be used for paraphilic offenders because there's many more side effects, uh, many more adverse effects when it comes to osteopenia, porosis, depression, those type of things that come with it. So in summary with paraphilia is, don't ask, they won't tell you. Uh, if you see smoke, there's usually a lot of fires going on underneath. Uh, the evaluation tends to be multifaceted uh, depending upon the setting in which you're in. Uh, and there's many different types of treatment, and of course, we need to be assessing risk. Um, one of the good things, one of the good, really quick and dirty uh, risk assessment tools is called the STATIC-99. Uh, this is normed on Canadian sex offenders. And Canada, like the, unlike the United States, approaches stuff as a public health problem. They see people with paraphilia as suffering from paraphilia. And as such, they said, look, we can't keep them in jail forever. How are we going to keep them from reoffending? So if you think about Carl Hansen, Kafka, um, the other people, they're all Canadians. And um, they actually look at it from the standpoint of research, and they developed the Static 99, which is, I think, a five-question questionnaire to establish somebody's risk of offending over a one, three-year, and five-year period. Um, so it's a fairly simple thing to sort of look at, uh, but it's not the only thing when it comes down to it. So with that, I'll stop with the... With the Paraphilias, any questions about that? And we're going to transition over to gambling. No? Okay, should we take a break right now and get some air? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so as an internist, this is something that I haven't professionally been exposed to a whole lot. Right. Um, but now as an addiction medicine fellow, it's come up not infrequently. Right. And so what are the requirements on my end as a physician hearing about this? For example, somebody who um, maybe this is the first time they're talking about it, Great. Is there any like requirements on my end? So the the yeah, I mean your question is reporting requirements. And yeah. so one of the things that I'm very clear with my clear with everybody that I talk to about is like these are these are my reporting requirements. If I think that you have touched a child, uh, abuse you know, dangerous to self, others uh, abusing uh, elderly, and as of January 1, 2016, they required us to report viewing child pornography. Now, with the touching of children, there is no statute of limitations. 
child abuse, there is not a statute of limitations. You must report that. Now, having said that, um, who knows what's been reported when? CPS gets a lot of reports, and one of the ways that I would recommend approaching reports to Child Protective Services is that you can always call anonymously. You're reporting, you're just not identifying the person that you're reporting. You tell them the story and the caseworker will tell you, this is something, yeah, this needs to be reported or it doesn't need to be reported. So for example, they abused the child 30 years ago in Nebraska someplace. They'll be like, yeah, don't bother. Uh, and they may ask you questions. You think that, you know, if you have a reasonable concern that somebody's at risk, then you have to report that that starts to bring in things like Tarasoff. Um, but usually when I'm talking to patients, uh, I tell them that once, but if I hear them starting to go there, I remind them, like, look, these are the things that I have to say. And it's not that I don't want them to tell me, it's just they need to be informed that like if they cross, if they break the glass in that way, I'm gonna have to say something. So um, I tell them that, I'd have them sign the informed consent form around uh, mandatory reporting, but the other piece of it is that when they start to get close to that edge, I say, remember, I gotta talk, about, I gotta say something if I hear this. And they appreciate that, but sometimes they go on and call CPS up and they say, hey, this is going on. They're like, eh, don't bother. Sometimes they say, yeah, we'll take a report and we'll investigate. Uh, and so, but I want to make, I want patients to be, or I want patients to be really clear where that line is. Uh, if they report watching child pornography, you got to report. No statute of limitations on that. What about things that are not involving children? Like sex abuse, even though they're in that kind of time? You don't have to report that. Yeah, that's, and of course that comes the risk of danger to others. And typically danger to others is typically construed as homicide-ish, but it's not clear. For example, if somebody has a rape paraphilia, that's a concerning one, and that's something that potentially needs to be reported, something that may potentially need to be reported depending on somebody's risk. And I think that the, the key word here is imminence. So imminence, if you think that there's an imminent danger, that's, I think that's usually the thing. You know, what makes an imminent danger? I'm not quite sure uh, for rape paraphilia. Do I, I need to understand the complete clinical picture? What are the antecedents? When are they likely to reoffend? What's going on in their life? Uh, but if at some point they disappear from care and I'm worried because they've gone back to binging on stimulants or something like that, mm, you know, I don't know, but better to be on the safe side and report rather than not. So, good question. 